Medical Center sponsored Maritime Speaker Series. We appreciate you being here. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, we ask that you keep your video and your sound off, muted. Uh, for those of you who are here, please check your phones, make sure that they're on silent. Um, please hold your questions to the end. We're going to get through his presentation. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, we encourage you to ask questions at the end, test his knowledge, especially at Death's Door and Museum up north. Um, so with that, I'm going to present to you Mr. Brennan Christensen to present to you tonight about the Barry Loon, a journey of a Door County boat. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, as Paige has pointed, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, as Paige pointed out, my name is Brennan Christensen. I am the site manager of the Death Storm Maritime Museum in Gills Rock, and there. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Brennan Christensen. <laughs> I'm the site manager of the Death Storm Maritime Museum and collections coordinator of the Door County Maritime Museum. I'm going to present to you today on the Barry Loom. <clears throat> so many of us has gone on many journeys in our lives, many great adventures to far off places. We've met wonderful people. We've had uh, great times and we've come back and we've talked about them to friends. We've written them, wrote them down. We've posted them online. We've made videos about them and even made lectures about them. And uh, it's really good to be able to talk to someone to get that story. Much like us, objects also have very interesting stories. They go to far off places. They have very intricate and complex creation stories. They have great adventures they've been on. And as much as I would like to just walk up to the Barry Loon and say, hey, uh, tell me your story. I want to make a lecture about you. And trust me, if I had that ability, my job would be a thousand times easier. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. So uh, instead, we need to go to people who have interacted with the Barry Loon, people who put time into restoring it, people who have family members who have built it. Uh, we need to look at letters that were written to us and to other people in our archives and to create a narrative from all these sources. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> a narrative from all these sources. And so I'm gonna present to you tonight uh, information I've gotten from all of our letters and uh, archives and our objects that we have, including the boat itself. So, uh, before I can really talk about the Barry Loon itself, I have to talk about the family that had it built, and that would be the Koken family. So uh, in the mid-1800s, Ernest Koken uh, opened up a barbershop supply manufacturing store called um, Koken Supply Company. Uh, over time, Koken Supply Company would become the largest barbershop supply company in the world, employing over 250 people with a manufacturing business uh, based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he later on passed on the company to his son, Walter Koken, who we will be talking more about. And uh, as you would imagine, someone with a large company, uh, with such an employee base, would also have vacation homes and other such properties, which he did. He had a vacation home on Washington Island with about 86 acres. Uh, and him and his family would go up uh, during the month of July every year to spend time going on boats and uh, spending time with family. Um, and as you would imagine, he decided that he needed to have some kind of pleasure craft that he could have uh, for the family to do many of the things they wanted to on Washington Island. So in 1916, Walter Koken reached out to uh, a small shipbuilding yard on Washington Island called Jepson Boatworks, and he ordered the construction of a pleasure craft. So uh, much to my personal disappointment and frustration, we don't really know who designed the Barry Loon for certain. So we don't have any actual schematics or blueprints of the Barry Loon. Um, instead, we have a letter that came from Ernest Koken, who was the middle child and son of Walter Koken, not to be mistaken with Ernest Koken, the father of Walter Koken. I know there's a lot of names that get quite confusing. Um, so the letters we have from him talk about most of our early knowledge on the Barry Loon from its construction until about 1950. Uh, so uh, in a letter he wrote to the museum, he talks about this complication with where the design came from. 
His father did make model boats, usually two to three foot toys, basically, that he would use in Missouri. But um, the thing is, is that the boat was designed and built in 1916. So the problem is, is that Ernest Koken was born in 1916. So he doesn't really have any working memory of his father working on any plans. Uh, and no one in his family were really like drafters. They never really made designs for stuff. Uh, but uh, Walter Koken claimed he made it and no one really said otherwise. Uh, it, but it's also possible that someone at Jepson Boatworks had it designed. It's also possible that he just asked for specifications and then someone made a more detailed plan on those. But it's also very well possible that Walter himself uh, made the plans, but we just don't have any physical proof of that. And uh, we probably never will have any such proof since it's such a unique boat. Um, however, uh, one thing we do know is that he took great care in its materials. So the Barry Loon was made out of very expensive materials for the time. It was made of 100% Missouri white oak. All of it was quarter sawed. As you can see from the diagram over here, when you typically saw a log, you just cut it horizontally. Uh, but the quarter saw instead cuts it into quarters and then saws it uh, vertically instead. This is more technical and uh, takes a lot more labor. So it's more expensive than the typical cut. Uh, but according to Ernest, his father inspected and cured every single piece of wood that went into the boat and then shipped it up to Washington Island to be constructed. Also, the, um, the steering wheel, its knobs were made out of rosewood and all the exposed metal was made out of sea brass. The engine itself was uh, only referred to as a Wolverine engine, which was a five horsepower four stroke engine. It was more known for its power rather than its speed. And it was very reliable. It was also waterproof, so it could go during uh, difficult times. If it started to rain, the boat wouldn't malfunction. Hmm. So let's uh, get back to the actual construction of the boat. As I mentioned in 1916, Walter Koken ordered the construction of the Barry Loon. Um, and so he uh, contacted the head of the company. His name was uh, William Jepson. And uh, Jepson told him that by the time the ice leaves Detroit Harbor, the Barry Loon would be completed. This means Detroit Harbor, Southern Washington Island, not Detroit, Michigan. I know also that can get confusing. Um, and so um, he would arrive in July. So that'd be plenty of time even after the ice left the harbor so that it would be completed. So he arrived in July, he went to pick up his boat and the Barry Loon wasn't completed. The Barry Loon wasn't even halfway done. The Barry Loon was basically the keel and some ribs sticking out of it. Uh, reportedly, Walter was disgusted by um, what was actually done. Thing is, is that uh, William Jepson, also known as Captain Bill Jepson, also known as Yip Yap Jepson by local children because he liked to talk so much. Um, not to be mistaken with Captain Bill Jepson, who was his son, who was the head of the Gills Rock Ferry Line, which eventually became the Washington Island Ferry Line. Uh, again, repeating names gets rather complicated. Um, uh, he was known for his skill in his design and his manufacturing. However, he was not exactly well known for his time management skills. And so the Barry Loon was very far behind. Walter was rather angry at this. And so he basically demanded that he be allowed to help because he didn't trust it could get done in time. And so throughout the summer, they worked on it. And with their combined skill and with their ingenuity, they were able to complete the Barry Loon in August, just for the vacation to end and have to go back to St. Louis. So he wouldn't be able to enjoy the boat for another year. <clears throat> so where does the name come from? Well, uh, as shown with these pictures here, uh, in the early 1900s, author Maurice Metterlink wrote a book called The Bluebird of Happiness, which was then made into a play, which was then made into a children's book called The Bluebird of Happiness for Children. Uh, this was very popular with um, Walter's wife, Alice, and their five kids. And so Alice insisted that this new boat be called the Fairy Barry Loon. Walter didn't really like this. He thought that the name wasn't manly enough. And so they went back and forth and they compromised on the name Barry Loon instead. Uh, by the way, the Bluebird of Happiness has been made into a play, several adaptations on film, and even a cartoon show, which that's the Fairy Barry Loon on an animated version of the play. And um, on a personal note, I never really knew where the name came from initially. Our sign doesn't mention where it comes from. My boss 
uh, two years ago or so reached out to me and said, where does the name come from? And I said, I'm not really sure, but I'll look into it. And I Googled it. And one was our own website that said, come see the Barry Loading Gills Rock. And it didn't explain that. And another one, I found this. And I thought, there's no way that this boat was named after this play. That just seems ridiculous. Forgetting that the boat was made in 1916. The play came out around 1909. And it was popular at the time, thinking it had to be something that was popular in my age. So, you know, uh, I was kind of taken aback when I found a letter saying that this actually was the reasoning. So uh, it's a little bit on my part. Okay, so, uh, so a lot of these photos here are actually from uh, Rip Koken, who is the son of Ernest Koken, uh, the one who we get the letters from. So he's not Walter's brother, he's Walter's grandson. And um, he gave us several of these photos for us to use for this. So I'm going to talk about some of the uses that the Kokens used uh, on the island with the Berry Loon. So um, the Koken family didn't just have one boat, they actually had three, one of which was a sailboat called the Scaramouche. Uh, that one was bought in 1920. Walter Koken used to go to the Ephraim sail regatta that would happen every year. And he bought one boat, which was one of six, which was made at Sturgeon Bay Boat Works. And uh, his daughter Jane liked the name Scaramouche and they named it Scaramouche. There may have been more to that. I don't know where the Scaramouche comes from. That's a whole nother presentation. So, uh, uh, so basically every year they would go back and sail in the regatta and Ernest, who was about six at this time, uh, would follow behind them. But at a separate time, Walter was with some friends and he was sailing off Washington Island in the Scaramouche. But then in the afternoon, the waters got really calm, the wind stopped and it became becalmed or basically the ship couldn't move because it had no propulsion. It didn't have an engine in it, it was purely sail. And so Ernest decided that he was gonna go rescue his dad. So at six years old, he hopped into the Barry Loon. And at this time, he was too short to see over the canvas spray shield. So he actually had to look underneath it Kind of like when you go driving in a cold morning and you heat up the car and the windshield just gets enough space uh, on the bottom there to see through it. So you have to scout sun very low in your car so you can drive through. Yeah, basically that, but with a six-year-old. Um, and so then he went out. Thing is also is the engine didn't have like a pull start or a press start. You actually had to turn the flywheel and he was too weak to actually do that. So he had to take off his shoes, sit down and actually kick the flywheel to get the engine started which was very dangerous because he could have mashed his feet inside of the open um, <laughs> uh, machinery, but he did get it started and he would uh, sail out to get his father. But from his father's perspective, the kid who couldn't even see over the spray shield, it looked like the Barry Loon was operating itself and coming to rescue him until he got right next to them and he saw a six-year-old driving this and he was very proud of his son. He then immediately took over the situation hooked up his boat and towed it back and then got someone to train him how to properly use it so he wouldn't break his feet. Um, so that's one story. Now, you might be asking, wait, Walter Koken was a wealthy industrialist who had property on Washington Island. Surely he hanged out with other wealthy industrialists who were renowned in Wisconsin history. And thank you, theoretical person, for asking the question I need to transition to the next part of my presentation. You would be right. Um, <laughs> Holy Evanrude of Evanrude Motors, along with his wife, Bess Emily Evanrude, and their son, Rolf, would also vacation on Washington Island, and they would go up to visit the Koken family, at least according to Ernest's letter. Um, and uh, Oli liked the, the Barry Loon, he liked the engine in it, and he wanted to go out fishing on it. So he asked the Kokens if they would take him out to go on a fishing trip. And they said, of course, they saw him as a friend, they would go out together, they went out, they had a good time, they came back. And then Oli went back down to Milwaukee where the company was based out of. Um, thing was, is a few days later, they were looking through the benches, which could open up and they found an envelope inside. And in the envelope, there was a sizable amount of money along with a bill for the fishing trip. Thing was, is Walter kind of took that as an insult because they were not for renting and uh, or for hire, and instead thought this was a um, a favor that he was doing for a friend. So instead, he mailed the money back to him because his family wasn't for sale. So um, uh, according to the letter, at least there was a little bit of awkwardness the next time it came up, but there wasn't really anything brought up after that point. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the Wolverine engine was very reliable. And it was waterproof, so you didn't really need to worry about rain and such. 
Uh, one time, though, Ernest and his older brother, John, were uh, in the Barry Loon uh, around Plum Island. And according to the letter, it was starting to downpour. So John thought it would be needed to take a canvas sheet they had and throw it over the engine to protect it from the water. This was rather redundant as it was waterproof. But at this time, his uh, brother probably was somewhere in his early teens. So he probably didn't know that all too much. Uh, thing is, it actually made it worse as the canvas actually got caught in the engine itself and broke parts of it. And so they were basically stranded with their boat, a small child and a young teenager uh, near a storm off Plum Island. Luckily, if people are from the area, you know that on Plum Island, there's a Coast Guard station, or there was one, it's getting repaired now. Um, and so the Coast Guard brought out what they called the bull to come rescue them, and they dragged them back to Plum Island. But the Wolverine was a rather, uh, I think, simple machine because they were able to repair it with makeshift tools. They were able to create a new ignition rod on the spot, and in about three hours, the Barry Loon was up and running again. They brought it back to Washington Island, and then they just went down with their lives. Uh, finally, uh, the Barry Loon wasn't really involved in really any major crashes or any such things. However, it did have a lot of fender benders, mostly due to Walter's wife, Alice. So uh, the thing was, is that uh, she would go on errands or just to go around in the boat with kids, and she would need to park the boat back at their dock. Thing is, is that it's not like a car, you can just put it in park. She had to kind of put the transmission in neutral. And what happened was is she would always fail at this. And instead it would be at half throttle and it would keep ramming into the dock. Thing is, is the Barry Loon is very well constructed. So there aren't any dents or scratches or broken boards or any such things. So um, uh, yeah, so it was basically fine. But after that point, Alice decided that it wasn't really in her future to really operate the Barry Loon again. So she just never operated after that point. So just some nice family time here. So on to the depressing part. <clears throat> so um, Great Depression. Uh, the Culkin family lose uh, a lot during this time period. And so when the Great Depression hits, their large uh, corporation obviously starts to uh, lose money. Um, people can't really buy things as much anymore. And then in 1937, Walter Koken died around the age of 49, I believe. And uh, then the company really started to take a dive after that point. They still had the land on Washington Island. They still had the boats. They still had the property. Uh, but now they needed to find more ways for to get money involved in keeping up that property. They could have sold it. They could have done many things with it. But for some unknown reason, to me at least, um, Alice Koken decided she was going to open up a girl summer camp on their a large property on the island. Um, that didn't work out. And I don't really have any real information on this part. This is more offered as background by Ernest Koken. Uh, but what we do know is that the government wanted property taxes for the land and she never told her family her business didn't work out. So uh, basically um, Ernest wasn't exactly sure why. He had a few ideas. He thought maybe his mother was embarrassed that the business didn't work and they were in rough times. Maybe she thought that this couldn't happen to her. Maybe she thought there wouldn't be major consequences to not paying your property taxes. Uh, for whatever reason, she didn't tell anybody. The taxes were never paid and the government took the land for delinquent taxes. Uh, after that point, um, basically everything they had on Washington Island was basically lost. And Arnie Richter came along who uh, owned the Washington Island Ferry Line and bought the property. Uh, um, so after that point, the Barry Loan was basically in his possession, but not legally, but not because he stole it. Rather, the Barry Loan was actually registered to Ernest Koken, Walter's son, not to his, um, his uh, widow. Alice. So the boat was never really taken by the government, but Ernest never came to pick it up. So uh, it's, at least according to Ernest's letter, he thinks that Arnie just had the land and the boat was on the land. So he just assumed the boat was his now and he used it for about two years. And then when Ernest was made aware that the boat was still his, it was still registered to him. He went back up, he explained the situation and Arnie Ricker just handed the boat back. So it's most likely this was a miscommunication on who actually owned the vessel, not so much like a theft or something like that. Uh, but anyways, Ernest now had the boat, but he couldn't afford to keep it. So he could keep it up, he knew how it worked, but his family didn't really have the money they used to. So he decided to sell it. He ended up selling it to his mother's former employee, Ella, who was married to a retired Coast Guard officer named 
Philip Carlson, and they sold the boat for an undisclosed amount, or at least from the letters we have. I don't really have a bill of sale. And this would be around 1950. In the letter that he gave to us in 1994, he said this was sometime between 52 to 54, but we actually, the one real artifact we have of the Barry Loon, besides the boat itself, is its boat registration from Carlson, which was from 1950 to the 9th Coast Guard District. So, um, I would show that the boat was at least in his possession as early as 1950. And since Ernest says that a lot of this was never written down, this was all from his memory, and he was writing this uh, over 40 years after the fact, he probably was just guessing about what time he no longer had the boat. Um, and so now we'll move on to the next era, away from the Koken family and onto the Carlson. Here's the problem with that though. Um, we don't know too much about this time period with the Barry Loon. We know the effects it had, but we don't really know much about what happened while he owned it. So Philip Carlson had the boat from about 1950 to his death in 1976. So for 26 years, the Barry Loon was in his possession. Thing is, um, we don't have any notes from him. We don't have any letters from him. We don't have any kind of detailed. We have some stuff from Ernest after he talked to Ella. And uh, we have some stuff from uh, the people who would restore the boat later, but we don't have too much from them. That doesn't mean we can't get this in the future. Maybe eventually we will get an account from them and add to the story. But for now, we can only kind of guess what happened and talk about its effects. There are basically two major effects that happened during this time period. One is that the engine was replaced. So we're not exactly sure why. Ernest believes that uh, it could have fallen overboard in a storm. It's possible that they scrapped it. He thinks it's most likely he just sold the engine. Uh, according to him, he talked to Ella Carlson and she believed the Wolverine was in good shape when it was sold. So there didn't seem to be any pressing issue. Um, however, he replaced it with a two stroke, five horsepower Straubel engine. It's very well possible that Straubel just was easier to get parts for. And so he went for something that was still in service. Uh, but I can't really say why. All we know is that he did replace it. And the Barrelin today still has a Straubel engine attached. I don't know if this was the engine that Carlson added or if it was a replacement later in restoration. The other big one and the obvious one, as you see from these pictures here, there's a large wooden shield on the front of it now of glass and wood. This was the major uh, change when this happened. This was still the Barry Loon. And I believe these photos were from after Carlson died because they kept it on their lawn afterwards. And this was right before it was bought again by someone else. Um, we're not sure if Carlson actually added it himself, if he just had it added on for him, but we know that it was on there and it was quickly taken off afterwards. But uh, basically until 1976, it was in their possession. And this is what the Barry Loon looked like uh, when it was bought again. So um, <clears throat> uh, now we'll talk about its restoration. So um, uh, right here, we have pictures of David Nelson and that is the family of John Jekylls. I do not have a picture of Mr. Jekylls, but in 1976, Mr. Uh, Judge John Jekylls and his wife uh, who's the woman in the wheelchair there, uh, were biking on Washington Island. Um, while they were on the island, they came across the Barry Loon, which was on the property of Ella Carlson. And um, Jekylls was part of the Green Bay Yacht Club, and he thought this would be a good restoration project. So um, they went to Mrs. Carlson, and they offered to buy it from her. She really didn't have any use for it at the time, and so she sold it to them. And then they, uh, both Nelson, we have pictures of Nelson and Jekylls transporting it from Washington Island to Fish Creek and then down to Green Bay for restoration work. However, they didn't really know what the Barry Loon looked like before. As I mentioned, we don't really have schematics of anything of this. So um, instead, they actually reached out to Ernest Koken. Uh, so in 1978, they wrote to him, they had a phone conversation and he gave them the detailed schematics of what, or the information of what the boat actually looked like. It actually, um, uh, its dimensions, what kind of engine it used, what the materials were made out of, and what it was there. In this time, uh, David Nelson revealed how much he really disliked the alteration, calling the shield extremely ugly, and so he quickly had it removed. And so he made it to what it looks like there. Um, my first season as site manager, 
um, the Jekylls came up and they said that they donated the Perry Boom. At that time, I didn't really know anything about the boat and I welcomed them in. I took their picture for a Facebook post and she mentioned that her husband, she remembered her husband and Mr. Nelson were in their garage on many nights working on that together. And so, um, yeah, I believe that's Mrs. Jekylls and uh, I believe her daughters and their son-in-law, don't question me on that one exactly, but uh, they're all related. That's the one part I do know about that. Um, and so um, after this point, they held on to it for several years until 1993, when they decided to donate it to the Door County Maritime Museum. So um, in 1993, they reached out to uh, our museum and they ha we have several short conversations of its significance, where it comes from, and our museum's interest in taking it. And eventually, uh, there was this agreement to hand it over to us. And in June of 1993, uh, we were given this by both David, Ness David Nelson and John Jekylls, um, after which point it needed to be appraised. So uh, Timothy Grawl of Timothy Grawl Marine Design uh, was given the case to look this over, and he wrote a full-length analysis, and he actually, I have a quote from him on this, if I can figure out how my jacket works. Oh, wrong guy. Sorry, new jacket. <clears throat> in his analysis in 1993, he states, and I quote, the subject vessel has been carefully restored to its original condition and represents a type of boat no longer constructed. As an antique, for display purposes, it is virtually flawless. However, the fuel system should be brought into compliance with current standards if it is to be used. The craft is in sound condition and, in the surveyor's opinion, has a market value of approximately $6,000 its replacement value or cost to duplicate is estimated at twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. The report's much longer than that. That's just a summary at the end of it. And I will dramatically put this back into my jacket again. <clears throat> there we go. And so uh, it was then uh, decided to put back into Gills Rock, close to where it was originally built. And so it was brought up to Egg Harbor and then Bailey's Harbor. Um, through um, for some parade, and then it was put onto display where it is currently located. It was given the accession number for any museum fans out there, 1993.3.1, through a very complicated means. That means it was the second donors of 1993. Don't ask me why right now, that's a whole nother complicated issue, um, which I'm working on. So, um, uh, and so it went on display. So. The thing is, is that at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that artifacts have stories. They have gone on journeys. They have interesting uh, information to tell us. And as much as I would like to have the ability to anthropomorphize objects and ask them stories to make exhibits about them, again, my job would be so much easier if I could do that. Can't really do that. But beyond that, the big thing is, is that an object story doesn't end when it's donated to a museum. It doesn't suddenly get created go on a great big adventures and then it's put on display and then the story's over. The story continues after that point. This was on display and as of this year, the Barry Loon has been with the Door County Maritime Museum for 30 years. And uh, its story is still continuing. And so this is the part where I start talking about my branch of the York County Maritime Museum and what's coming up in the coming season. So. I've read some early surveys from, I think, the early 2000s and the 90s about uh, the Gills Rock Maritime Museum, uh, now the Death Storm Maritime Museum. And when asked, what is your favorite part, people would always say the Hope. The Hope makes sense. It's a fishing vessel from the 1930s. You can walk around inside it. There's a working model in front of it uh, that was actually operated at its donation. And we have a final video of its day in operation. Great piece. I understand why people like it. When asked what is your least favorite, it's always the Barry Loom. And it's not because the Barry Loom doesn't have an interesting story. I just told you a magnificent story about the Barry Loom. Um, it's um, more that it was put into the museum. It was basically given this one stand right here. 
and there were pictures of Coke and barbershop chairs next to it, which confused me. Coke and barbershop chairs was made by the family's company and are actually collector's items today, uh, but it didn't have context of why it was there. It was telling us that was the family that made it. But for the longest time, I thought that was the chair that was in the Barry loan uh there because there were just pictures of barbershop chairs and i thought maybe that's what that means and so um the thing is is that this coming season there's going to be a lot of restructuring of the museum physically um so we've decided to move net to table for our current exhibit on the fishing industry it's currently on collapsible walls it will be reprinted and moved over to a more permanent area of the museum so it can be fully on display permanently um, we're taking down that section. We've moved um, some plywood walls. We've broken them down and a lot of the miscellaneous artifacts are being moved into storage. Uh, the area talking about death's door, which I gave a presentation last year on that subject, uh, we'll be updating that. So we've taken down the information on that one. The Washington Island Ferry Line exhibit, which video you can play, has been on display for 20 years, talking about the newest model, the Arnie Richter, which was made in 2003, will now be replaced with an exhibit that talks about the Madonna, which was built in 2020, with pictures taken by Jim Legault, and that will be on display. We got them from the Wisconsin Maritime Museum in Manitowoc, so that will be on display there. And so all these exhibits that have been on display for so long, but really need to be updated, will finally be updated. And the Barry Loon is part of that. So the Barry Loon, as you can see, is kind of just oblongly shoved into a corner. Instead, we'll be removing the collapsible walls, turning it on its side, so the entire back side of the museum will be on the Barry Loon. A new sign will be made by Southern Custom Exhibit, along with the historic photos I showed here, printed on there, and the boat registration from 1950, along with its dimensions and its technical details we put alongside it as well. And so it will be given a much more prominent spot in the Death Storm Maritime Museum in the coming season. So if you ever find yourself in Gills Rock this coming season, or you are just in Door County in the coming season, please come up to the Death Storm Maritime Museum. You may even find me up there and I can give you more information on this wonderful boat. So thank you very much. Um, and if you would like more information about the Barry Loan, Brennan wrote an amazing article for the Beacon, which is the Door County Maritime Museum's publication. Um, I have some on the back table. So right as you're exiting, you can grab a copy if you want to read more about it. Before we get into questions, I want to thank tonight's sponsors, the Door County Medical Center, yay, I did it, and Bridgeport, Bridgeport Resort, because they house a lot of our speakers when they come into town. Um, so with that, who has questions for Brennan about the Barry Loon? Nobody? Really? Okay. So the question is, Jeff's at Fort Worth, is that this to the west of the Barry Loon office there? Thing is, I don't really know. So I've reached out to some other people looking for information on this presentation. Uh, I mentioned here, these are basically what I uh, had to work with. And I did reach out to the Washington Island Archives and recently they got back to me and they said they were gonna share some things they had. But when I asked them about Jepson Boatworks, they said, are you sure you're not talking about Bill Jepson from the ferry line? And I said, no, it's his dad. And they weren't exactly sure as far as I know, but I've been talking with them. So I have actually very little information about Jepson Boatworks, its location. The only thing I got from it is one of Yip Yap Jepson, as he was lovingly called, as well as that the shipyard actually cl closed shortly after the Barry Loon was constructed. I don't know if this is because he retired or they were just financially not stable, uh, but basically the shipyard was only in operation until about 1917, 1918. After that point, it just stopped. So, but from what I can tell, their property was around Detroit Harbor. And from what I've been told, their, um, the vacation home they have is still on the property of the Puritans who now own the ferry line. That's Arnie Richter's daughter's family. Her husband was Dick Puritan and their son Hoyt Puritan currently runs the ferry line. So as far as I've been told, that house is still on their property. So it would make sense that it would actually be around Detroit Harbor in that area is where it was constructed. So 
question. Um, you know, the uh, uh, Fishing Hall of Fame has a lot of evidence, old boards mm -hmm. go back forever. Have you ever had any contact with the evidence or the around or anything with connection to the Washington Island anymore that you're aware of? Uh, well, we've tried reaching out to people about stuff. The thing is, with our outboard motor collection, we have about 50 outboard motors total. And uh, most outboard motor corporations that we have don't exist anymore. Most of them were gobbled up by OMC, which O.E. Evinrude helped found in 1929. Uh, and then it became a corporation. I don't know when the Evinrude stopped being involved with OMC. And then OMC went bankrupt around I think like 2002, yeah. some 20 years ago. Uh, we tried talking to uh, Kikoffer Mercury and Brunswick. We haven't been able to get any contact with them before. So I think I am sure we've tried, but I don't think we've ever actually reached out to anyone from the Evan Roots. Um, and this was an account all from one letter in 1994. And at this time, mm -hmm. Ernest Koken was in a retirement home in Washington. So he was remembering stuff that happened when he was six. And at this time, he was nearly 80 years old. So I don't know the exact idea of their connection with the Evan Root family. But again, very large corporations. It's very likely that they knew each other if they're both wealthy people visiting Washington Island around the same time. But uh, that would definitely be an avenue to go down. Um, yeah. How did uh, you happen to be gifted these letters? Do you know? Yes. Um, so um, this actually, I can talk about the references right here, and that kind of goes into that. Most mm -hmm. of the information we have from well, prior to the donation comes from just about three people, uh, David Nelson, John Jekylls, who were working together, and Ernest Kogan. And so uh, in 1978, they re John Jekylls and David Nelson both wrote letters to Ernest Kogan and asking him for the schematics, like I mentioned. And so they had letters uh, that they sent him and came back because the letters were mailed back and forth. Even old copies were sent back. And then when they uh, donated the bear loom to us, they also donated the letters they sent to Ernest Koken and they gave them to us. And the Kokens are still around the area. So Rip Koken, who I mentioned gave me the photos, I think he actually works with the um, uh, Friends of Plum and Pilot Island. I even asked him if he wanted any information added and said he's in negotiations with something on Pilot Island right now. So, um, if we needed extra information, we can still reach out to them. The big letter we got was in 1994 when we wrote to him, and by we, I mean former people. This was even before I was born. Um, okay, Brennan, okay. you're a small child. We get it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I am quite young. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, we reached out to him in uh, 94. And he wrote us a short letter at first saying he was going to recollect everything. And about two weeks later, he sent us a big letter about six to 10 pages long. And I transcribed that. And so none of these letters are actually published, but I do have transcriptions of them all. And I can also make scans of them all as well. So these are where we got the letters from. And if anyone is interested, I can give you copies of the letters 